Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. The first economics book that I ever read was called Free to Choose, and it was by Professor Milton Friedman. The book just really made me fall in love with economics, and it demonstrated to me the importance of understanding how the economy works if we're going to have any intelligent political opinions. So today I have somebody on who's going to talk to us about the late Professor Friedman. Today's guest is a professor of economics at the University of Rochester, and he's also a writer at his own blog, The Big Questions. Professor Stephen Landsberg, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So Milton wasn't always interested in economics. What were his early academic interests? His early academic interests were in uh, statistics, where he was actually he actually achieved uh, considerable prominence as a statistician, but uh, ended up uh, moving from there to economics. I'm not sure exactly what what triggered that. Uh, his very earliest work in economics was on um, uh, the effects of occupational licensing and the extent to which you do real damage to the economy by requiring people to get licenses in order to become a beautician or a a uh, 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 manicurist or uh, any of a number of other things where it's not at all clear to the layman why you would need to license those things. Uh, so somehow he moved from doing um, excellent work in statistics to thinking about occupational licensing. I'm not sure what path he followed exactly to get from, from one place to the other. And what economists influenced him? Like who... Did he draw on whose ideas did he find most convincing? I'm sure he drew substantially on Irving Fisher, who was a great monetary economist of the time. Um, certainly was influenced by Arthur Burns, uh, who uh, later on was chairman of the Federal Reserve. Uh, but his uh, before he got really interested in monetary theory, his big interest was uh, the theory of what, e what economists call the theory of the consumption function. How do people decide how much to spend? And um, uh, that was his first big work. And it was the work primarily for which he got the Nobel Prize. Um, so that was his first really big splash in the profession. And there, I think he was influenced by, and I'm not sure if this is just coincidence or if there's some pattern here, but um, uh, there were a lot of female economists working on that problem at the time. Uh, Dorothy Brady, Margaret Reed, Rose Director, who later married Milton Friedman and became Rose Director Friedman. Those uh, those economists, uh, who again, perhaps just by coincidence, perhaps for some reason I'm not seeing, were mostly women, were, were I think the big uh, people who got him very interested in the consumption function, interested in working on it. They all had some very clever and thoughtful work on this, none of which he found entirely convincing. And uh, he ended up finding the answer that most economists since then have, have accepted. You mentioned the consumption function. What was the consumption function as set forth by Keynes? As set forth by Keynes, essentially, Keynes assumed that we tend to uh, spend a certain fraction of our income that if you get if your income goes up by a dollar you will spend an extra 80 cents or an extra 90 cents and all we have to do is look at your income uh changes in your income to determine what the change in your spending will be um that runs up against some uh big uh empirical problems for example we know from data and we already knew in friedman's time and in keynes's time that if Alice earns $20,000 more than her neighbor, she will spend each year maybe another fifteen or 16000 But if she earns $20,000 more than her grandfather, she will spend an additional $20,000. Um, and so uh, there's this great mystery here. Why, why, when you earn more than your neighbor, do you spend most of the difference? And when you earn more than your ancestor, you spend all of the difference. Uh, that was the big question that 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 uh, Friedman really attacked and uh, uh, to most economists thinking uh, solved. And I, I can talk about that solution or I, I actually that was going to be my next question. He actually wrote a book called The Theory of the Consumption Function. That's right. In it, he soundly refuted Keynes. What was his refutation? His big refutation was that I. I cannot just look at your income in order to predict 
your spending this year because you make your spending decisions not just based on your current income, but what you expect your future income to be. If you win the lottery this year and you win a million dollars, you're probably not going to spend it all this year. Uh, you're probably going to spread that over, out over your lifetime. Uh, if you get a raise this year of $10,000 and you expect that raise to be permanent, then it does make sense to raise your spending by about $10,000 a year. The, 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 the key is that consumption decisions are based not just on your current income, but on your expectations of future income. And that's really important for government. And it explains the earlier paradox I was talking about, because if Alice earns more than her neighbor, chances are it's because she's having an unusually good year. She doesn't, it, people who are earning more than their neighbors on average are having unusually good years. They don't expect their income to stay that high. They got an unexpected bonus this year or an unexpected inheritance or something. So you would not expect them to spend it all at once. On the other hand, if you earn more than your grandfather, it's probably because times have changed and uh, uh, that's a permanent change in your income. And so uh, we would, on Friedman's theory, expect you to spend almost the entire difference. And that again is what we see in the data. This has big implications for policy because Keynes believed that if we increase your income by a dollar, say by the government giving you a dollar, uh, then you're going to spend a large fraction of that dollar. Okay, Friedman pointed out that if the government gives you a dollar this year and you don't expect them to give you a dollar every year, you're going to look at that and say, well, I've got an extra dollar. I want to spread that out over 20 years. I think I'll spend an extra uh, uh, nickel a year. And then this is particularly true. It, this, 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 um, this effect is, is exaggerated by the fact that when the government gives me a dollar, I'm usually aware at some level that they probably borrowed that dollar from someplace. They're probably going to have to pay it back eventually, and they're going to raise my taxes eventually to pay it back. So not only is the dollar temporary, not only am I thinking this is a temporary change in my income, I'm also thinking somewhere in the back of my mind that my future income, my future post-tax income may well go down because of this. Uh, the government is building up debt. They're going to have to uh, tax somebody in the future. Maybe it's me. Uh, <laughs> and so I uh, uh, not, Keynes thought if they give me a dollar, I'm not going to think about the future at all. Friedman pointed out two things. One, if they give me a dollar, I'm not going to expect another dollar necessarily next year or the year after or the year after. So that puts a break on my spending. And secondly, if I'm a little more sophisticated in my thinking, I'm going to realize that my future taxes are now likely to go up. And so that puts yet another break on my spending as I'm thinking I better save for those lean years ahead. So Friedman's idea that if money coming in was basically a windfall, that people would tend to save it, spread it out because they know it's temporary. Whereas if they got a, a raise, for instance, or a promotion that was going to give them more money, they'd be more apt to spend it because they know the money is going to keep coming in. This is called the permanent income hypothesis, right? Absolutely. And in, in your view and in the, the view of most economists, Friedman soundly refuted Keynes. He on solved this that issue. problem. Yeah. yeah. He, uh, uh, and he did it. And um, it, it's interesting because his background was in statistics, but the work that he did that convinced the profession of this was not based on one fancy statistical analysis or, or a very technical statistical technique. It came from looking at a great number of different predictions that this theory made and checking that pretty much those predictions were all true. For example, uh, you know, we if 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 you get a uh, uh, if your income goes up this year and your consumption goes up by some amount. It's very hard for me to tell as an economist uh, what was going on in your mind, because you probably know better than I do how temporary that income increase was. I can't look in the data. In the data, I see people getting their, their incomes go up, but I don't know whose income went up temporarily and whose went up permanently. So it's hard to test this directly. But what I do know is that farmers, on average, have much more variable incomes than, say, factory workers do. Sure. And if I see in the data that a factory worker's income went up, 
I can say, you know, it's probably because that guy got a raise because that's why factory workers incomes do go up. It's probably permanent. I expect them to spend most of it. If a farmer's income goes up, I'm going to say probably that's because he had an unusually good year because that's what life is like as a farmer. And so I don't expect him to spend all of it. And you look in the data at factory workers and farmers, and this is exactly what you find. Um, and then he devised a number of other tests like that where he was looking at young people versus old people, black people versus white people, and uh, you know asked what this theory would predict in each of those cases. And the um, what convinced the profession was just the, the massive number of different confirmations, each of them statistically very straightforward, nothing fancy, but so many of them, uh, so many confirmations of the same theory. Uh, sort of the same way it occurs to me that that physicists became convinced that molecules were real and not just a convenient fiction. Because if you take the theory that molecules are real and you start making predictions with it, you get, and, and you start predicting the size of molecules based on many different kinds of uh, reasoning, you keep getting the same answer over and over again. And um, so, uh, you know, I would say he, he convinced economists of his theory of the consumption function, the permanent income hypothesis, in much the same way that physicists around the time of Einstein convinced the profession that, that molecules are real. Friedman's magnum opus, written with Anna Schwartz, was the monetary history of the United States, I think from 1867 to 1962. I might be might, might be off a little bit. My memory is 63, <laughs> but I'm not sure. It might be 63. You might be right. But what is the, the main thesis of the book? The main thesis of the book is that um, uh, I think Friedman liked to summarize it in two words, money matters. Um, that uh, if you increase the money supply, uh, that's going to have, you have to be careful here because in the long term, uh, it should have no effects at all. Uh, if I double the money supply, eventually all prices are going to double, all wages are going to double, and people are going to live their lives exactly as they did before. They're just going to uh, uh, they're going to be able to afford the same goods. They're going to produce the same output. But uh, the thesis was that in the short run, uh, there's an adjustment period during which some prices are adjusting faster than others. Some uh, incomes are adjusting faster than others. People at different rates are becoming aware of the amount of new money in the system and of what's going on. And during that time, there can be substantial disruptions. Um, uh, those disruptions are hard to predict. Uh, the effect of the money supply on the economy is subject to what Friedman always referred to as long and variable lags, so that over a period of a few years or so, uh, an increase in the money supply leads to more economic activity, not necessarily for reasons that you would want it to, and we can come to that later. Uh, it's not necessarily a good thing that it's leading to more economic activity. And uh, likewise, over that time period, a cut in the money supply or a failure of the money supply to grow as fast as people expected can lead to a decrease in economic activity. And um, that uh, most the most dramatic part of that book was the chapter on the Great Depression, where they argued that the Great Depression was very largely caused by the Federal Reserve allowing the money supply to fall. I was just going to ask you about the Great Depression. So he argued that under the Benjamin Strong's leadership, I think Benjamin Strong was the head of the New York branch of the Federal Reserve, that the, the money supply was handled properly. But then once Benjamin Strong was out, I don't remember if he died or what, but he was out. The next leadership came in and they basically bungled it, that the I think the, the money supply fell by one third. One third, yes. Yeah. And he says that at that time, they should have injected cash into the system. They didn't. And therefore, he puts the blame on the Federal Reserve. Why did the money supply contract? Well, there were a lot of bank failures. Um, and uh, the, the Fed chose to allow a lot of those bank failures. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember a, a, a succinct quote from Friedman on this also, and I'm I'm not sure I remember one. You may you may you may remember better than I. 
but uh, I think the, the the Federal Reserve did not take seriously uh, my my sense of the history, and it sounds to me like you may be familiar, uh, more up to date uh, on what's in Friedman and Schwartz than I am. Uh, it's been a long time since I looked at it, uh, but I think the Federal Reserve simply did not take seriously the idea that something uh, really drastic was going on, and they had the power to do something about it. I believe they also raised interest rates. Uh, yeah, which is would cause a, a decrease in the money supply. Full disclosure: On the Great Depression, I'm an Austrian. I mean, and and when it comes to economics, I, Friedman's idea of just the simple, you know, m prices raising and falling as a result of, of the money supply, where he didn't agree with the Austrians that you would end up with false signals leading to malinvestments that would cause the crash. I, I disagree with him, but I think he's spot on on some of his uh, analysis of the depression in terms of the, the money supply falling in, in, in response in part to the raising of the interest rates. And then of course the, you know, the tariffs and all the things that they did to try to stem the depression, which only exacerbated it through the new deal. Has he caught on in the economics profession it, or like is his explanation commonly accepted now as opposed to the idea that it's just capitalism unstable and leads to depressions? I, I think that there is a widespread, I, I don't want to say consensus because uh, certainly there are thoughtful, intelligent people like yourself who would um, who would disagree sometimes around the edges and sometimes much more fundamentally. But I think there is a, a widespread consensus in the profession that Friedman had the depression more or less right. But I don't I wouldn't go so far as to say that people think that those ideas are as relevant today as they were then, because the world has changed so much. Uh, a lot of Friedman's analysis of when, what went on at that time relied on the fact, for example, that the banking industry was much more heavily regulated than it is now. And a lot of his analysis is, is based on the way those regulations affected things. We have very different regulations now. We have a lot more monetary instruments now than we had then. We've got uh, Bitcoin, for example. We've got uh, uh, and many more financial instruments that people can move in and around among. Uh, it was fundamental to Friedman's analysis that the demand for money is pretty stable, that the uh, the amount of money people want to hold, in other words, the amount of money people want to hold changes only gradually over time and largely for predictable reasons. That turned out to be a very important assumption in his theoretical analysis. And I'm not sure we can even make sense of it anymore. I don't know what the demand for money is anymore because I don't know what money is anymore. Um, and again, there are so many, uh, there's been enough deregulation that people can uh, people can respond to changes in the economy in various ways that weren't even thinkable in Friedman's time. So uh, I, I, I think that to take the ideas that Friedman was working with, even if they were exactly right, and we can maybe disagree around the edges about how fully right they were for the time he was analyzing, I, I think there's a general sense among economists that we live in a very different world today and and you you need to think in new ways about how money affects the economy his two books for mass con mass consumption or mass reading were capitalism and freedom and free to choose and free to choose of course became the subject of the pbs series they were just full of jewels, one of which, as you as you mentioned earlier, when he talks about occupational licensing, if I'm remembering correct, and it's been about 20 years, maybe a little, more, yeah, a little bit more since I read Capitalism and Freedom, but he actually even suggested that doctors ought not to have to be licensed. I mean, he, he was pretty strong. And he was ahead of his time because sure. now we've got all these physicians assistants who are doing things that um, they don't need a medical license and they're doing things that in Friedman's time, everybody thought it would be crazy to let someone do without a medical license. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I, think he was, I think he was right. I, I happen to, to agree with him. So do I. And they, they are still licensed and it would probably be better if they weren't. But uh, they, the success of the physician's assistants certainly proves that all the people who were saying it would be crazy to let somebody who's not a doctor set your broken bone 
or it would be crazy to let someone who's not a doctor prescribe an antibiotic for the scratch on your leg. Uh, those people were wrong. And I, I think I think we all recognize that now. And benefit from it too. <laughs> and benefit from it too. I mean, the, the, the medical care you get is, is so much more available because of that. What other gems do you think he, he put forth in, in those books? Like things that were just very insightful, especially free to choose because it was the later book and could take more into consideration. You know, on the subject of occupational licensing, um, I'll just, uh, I'll add that the, you know, there's been recent work showing that when we think about occupational licensing, we think about, oh, well, if we're going to license doctors, we're going to have fewer doctors. If we're going to license uh, opticians, we're going to have fewer opticians. That is all true. But another big drawback to that licensing is that it makes it very hard for professional people or licensed people to move across states. Um, if you are somebody who paints people's nails for a living, in most states, that requires a license, and it's a state-specific license. So if I live in New York and I paint nails and I want to move to Vermont for some reason, it's very disruptive for me, and I may decide not to move because of that. So that there, are, there are big problems for the consumers because of it. There are big problems for the suppliers as well. Uh, as far as other gems, I, uh, one place which is a, a little less divorced from every everyday life, but uh, uh, one place where Friedman had an enormous impact was uh, convincing people that it was thinkable to have flexible exchange rates across currencies, um, uh, something that that, that that was considered, I, I think, really a crazy idea at the time. Uh, now, uh, 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 we've had flexible exchange rates for 70 years or so now, and I, I think most people agree that it has uh, been a great improvement in the way the world economy works. Um, his uh, his insight, I think, that government taxation and government borrowing are roughly equal as drags on the economy is a great insight uh, because what matters is the resources that the government consumes, not the re not the way they get a hold of those resources. If they borrow a dollar to buy a turkey, uh, or if they raise my taxes by a dollar so they can buy a turkey, uh, what really matters is they're going to consume a turkey that is now not available for somebody else to eat. And uh, that if you want to look at the burden of government, the issue is not where they're getting their money. Their issue is what resources are they destroying? And that's... Um, uh, that's, I think, been a very important insight that really has uh, uh, affected uh, the way economists think about the way the world works. Um, other subjects, I wish I had a copy of Capitalism and Freedom in front of me to remind myself what uh, what uh, policies he addressed. Um, there were, uh, well, if you don't mind, I'm just going to take a quick peek in my own book here and remind myself. Oh, of, sure. Uh, I'd just like to tell, would... tell you something. Two things that really struck me when sure. reading, reading these books is one, how the price system works, that prices send messages about what needs to be produced. And that when you screw around with that, you're going to end up with all kinds of errors because people simply don't know what demands are out there and what the best way to do things are. That was huge for me. Absolutely. And I think the the key person we want to credit with that insight is not Friedman, but Hayek, uh, which will do your awesome. I, I actually would say Mises. Uh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, that's where I would go. But that may that 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 may be. <laughs> but if we're talking about who forcefully made economists aware of this. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. Probably uh, not I even think... Mises, probably Menger, if I'm going to be honest, was pro probably the, the, the... And I'm sure you know that literature <laughs> far, far better than I do. Um, but uh, Hayek had a paper called The Use of Knowledge in Society. I'm sure you're, you don't yes. need to be told about it, but no. maybe we have some listeners who do. Sure. Uh, a paper called The Use of Knowledge in Society, I, I recommend it to everyone. It is easily readable. There's no math. There's no fancy analysis. The only reason I sometimes hesitate to recommend that article to students is that it is so straightforward and so clearly right when you read it 
that I think students sometimes come away with the impression that, well, this is a completely, nobody ever needed to say this. It's all so obvious. <laughs> there's, there's, yeah. there's nothing here that needs to be pointed out. And yet, in the context of what people understood at the time, it is absolutely profound. The idea that if we need a little more wheat, okay, and if you've got a government that is centrally planned, they're going to pick a farmer and they're going to say, you produce a little more wheat. And they're never going to do that wisely. They can't do it wisely because they don't know what the costs are on various farms. One farmer has used up all his most fertile land. And if he's going to grow more wheat, he's going to have to go to much less fertile land, which means he's going to use a lot more fertilizer, a lot more labor, use a lot more resources that people would otherwise have had to use. Another farmer happens to have an, an acre sitting fallow that he could easily put into cultivation. One farmer has a worker who didn't show up for work today. Another farmer has a surplus of labor. Uh, one farmer has a truck that just broke down and another farmer, all his machinery is working fine. Deciding which farmer should produce the extra wheat is disastrously expensive. You're going to make huge mistakes all the time and you can't avoid them. The miracle is that the price system solves that problem. If you allow the price of wheat to go up a little bit, then the farmer who can easily produce more wheat will produce more wheat. And the farmer who can't easily produce more wheat won't produce more wheat. And you get more wheat at the minimum possible resource cost. It's the most important insight that any economist has ever had. And uh, Friedman had a lot to do with popularizing it. Hayek, I think, had even more to do with popularizing it. Uh, so I, I want to, and, and, and others uh, uh, before them thought about it. I, I want to give them all credit. It's the most important idea that any economist has ever had. Another idea that really stood out to me. Now, I read Free to Choose in, I think, 1999. I would have been 22 or 23 years old. And he pointed out that we have real world experiments, basically, in capitalism versus socialism. Now, obviously, neither there's never been pure you know, capitalism or pure socialism, communism. But we do have instances where you have the same people, same geography, and the countries that were more socialistic than not compared to the countries that were more capitalistic than not. And he went through North Korea, South Korea, China and Hong Kong, China in, in Taiwan, Cuba, Florida. And, and, and he had some oh, West Germany, East Germany. And in every single case, the differences were stark in that the capitalist or the more capitalist economies vastly outperformed the, the more socialist economies. Absolutely. And that evidence is striking. But one thing that you might, that a, a reasonable person might object to is that there are a lot of cases, but it's still a pretty small number. We got sure. North and South Korea, we got East and West Germany, we got China and Hong Kong, we got a few more. You could argue that 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 he's offering six, seven, eight cases. And yet to, for, to go the same way in eight cases is pretty striking. But I, I think if you want to look for more data on this, there are places to look. Look at towns along the United States-Mexican border um, where you've got on both sides of the river pretty much the same people, pretty much the same resources, pretty much the same background, uh, pretty much the same ethnic mix. Um, and consistently, the towns on the American side are doing better than the towns on the Mexican side. The only significant difference you can point to between those towns is that the towns on the American side have had more economic freedom, less freedom than I would like them to have, but more economic freedom than the ones on the Mexican side have had. And there you have hundreds of cases, not just eight or 10. Um, Daron Asimoglu at MIT has looked at countries in Africa where uh, uh, the colonialists who ruled those countries for a long time set up, um, they, they gave a lot more economic freedom to some countries than to others. And those countries have consistently done better. Now, you could argue, you could say, oh, well, you know, maybe the causality goes the other way. They looked at the countries that were doing better and granted them more economic freedom. And Asimo Glu has some wonderful papers where he pretty much refutes that argument and argues that uh, the, the colonial policies were determined for essentially random reasons. Uh, we, the, it goes into quite a bit of the history there. 
and argues that the choice to give e more economic freedom in one place than another was almost entirely random. Uh, it was not based on how the countries were otherwise doing. It was not based on any other characteristics of the countries. So that makes this a good experiment. You've got you've got random assignments. It's a it's a good uh, natural experiment. And again, you see it all over Africa. The places with more freedom are the places that prospered. What is the main left wing critique of Friedman? Not of him personally. I know there's people complain that he was involved with the you know the Chicago Boys and Chile and all that, but of his economics, what do they critique about his economics? I don't. I, among economists, I think he's held in extremely high esteem across the ideological spectrum. I, I don't. You know, it used to be, and and of course, we're, there are different aspects of his work. If we're talking about his popular policy um, uh, recommendations, and you know, our, uh, one that you asked for examples before, and I somehow failed to come up with, was um, uh, vouchers for education. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, which we can come back to. Uh, if you look at his policy proposals, historically, the way that people have attempted to refute Friedman has been to quote him and then laugh uh, as if that were an argument. Uh, uh, and you used to see this with the, uh, I remember seeing it uh, with the medical licensing where people would, they would refute his arguments about medical licensing by quoting him and then laughing. That was that was the standard way to refute him. I, I just don't think we have to take that stuff seriously. Um as far as his academic work, I think many, I probably most economists would agree with what I said earlier that a lot of the monetary stuff is outdated. Um, the uh, that uh, the world works differently now, and however accurate that stuff was in the 30s and 40s and 50s, it's different now. Um, on the other hand, uh, his later stuff on monetary theory, which we haven't talked about yet, um, where he talked about the reasons why a change in the money supply might stimulate the economic activity and the reasons why that might be a bad thing. That is the center of modern macroeconomics. Uh, that, and I, I think everyone uh, sees that as a major, major advance. Um, what was that? Because that I'm unfamiliar with. I'm unfamiliar okay. So, with so the right argument right. there is that I'm unemployed. Um, why am I unemployed? Uh, it's because. Nobody is offering me a salary that makes it worth my while to work. Uh, I'm getting offered $20,000 and for $20,000, you know, with the expense of getting to work and so on, uh, I'd rather just stay home and sleep. Now, the Federal Reserve increases the money supply. And the long run effect of that is that all prices and all uh, wages are going to increase. I get a phone call. I wake up next, tomorrow morning and I get a phone call from a guy who's offering me $30,000 to work. Now this 30,000 is not gonna buy any more than 20,000 bought yesterday because the price of everything I buy is going up also. Uh, I'm telling a caricatured version of the story here. This actually plays out over more than a day or two. But uh, I get this phone call from a guy offering me $30,000 and I haven't been to the grocery store lately. So I'm not aware that all the prices are much higher than they were before. And I say, wow, $30,000, that's worth working for. Uh, so I take the job and uh, it takes me a little while to discover that all prices have gone up. And so this 30,000 is no better than 20,000 where it was yesterday. I really don't want this job, and I just, I, I just, I disrupted my life. I, 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 I took this job. I gave up some other things. I, uh, I changed my schedule so that I could take this job that, once I realize what's going on, I don't really want. Um, more significantly, and, and so this is this is a case of what we were talking about before. If you mess with prices, you mess up information. You mess up people's ability to figure out what's going on. Um, likewise. I'm a guy who I, I own a bicycle factory. I make a certain I know the price of bicycles. I know how many bicycles I want to make. One day the Federal Reserve increases the money supply. Prices start going up. I'm more attuned to the price of bicycles than anything else because I'm in the bicycle business. So I notice that bicycle prices are rising before I notice that all the other prices are rising. 
And I think, wow, there must be a big increase in the demand from bicycles. I think I'll build a new factory. And I build this new factory, and then I discover that actually there's been no increase in the demand for bicycles. Uh, there's just been a general increase in prices. Uh, you just fooled me into building a factory I shouldn't have built. Um, the um, the uh, uh, All these resources that went into building that factory, I built them to fill this new demand for bicycles that didn't exist in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, and so... Um, Friedman's argument, which he made in the 1960s, it was related to his earlier arguments on monetary theory, but it was really quite separate from them, uh, was that the main reason that changes in the money supply cause changes in the economy is that they fool people into making bad decisions. Uh, they make it difficult for people to understand. They make it difficult for people to figure out what their salaries are really worth. They make it difficult for people to figure out what the demand for their products is. And you fool them into making mistakes. You fool them into producing too much. You fool them into working more than they should be working, producing more goods than they should be producing, and using up too many resources in the process. Uh, so that even if you think you can stimulate the economy by raising the money supply, it's it's usually the long-term consequences of that are are very, very bad. Um, that is the center of modern macroeconomics, um, and there are still great controversies in macroeconomics, but essentially all work in modern macroeconomics across the ideological spectrum, across the technical spectrum, it all makes central use of that key insight that came from Friedman about 1968. A lot of libertarians are very critical of Milton Friedman. They say that he allows for far too much scope of government involvement in the economy. One of the funniest stories I've ever heard is Mark Skousen wrote that when he took over at the Foundation of Economic Education, one person came to him and said, listen, I just hope you start being tougher on Milton Friedman. And then somebody else came and said to him, I really hope that you can stop being so tough <laughs> on Milton Friedman. Are these criticisms of his uh, big government proclivities fair? Oh, I... Uh... I guess I would need more specifics about a particular policy proposal. Uh, well, the negative he he, for instance, advocated for a negative income tax, and, and in in my view, that's a, a disaster, a horrible idea. Um, he, well, what were some of the other things? The, the the even the voucher system would have to be government managed. Those are those are just a couple. Plus, he of course worked within the system of the federal government, advising you know Ronald Reagan, for instance. I, I think in both the cases you mentioned, um, my memory is that uh, Friedman was very clear that he did not think the things he was proposing were the best possible proposals. He thought they were the best possible proposals that had a chance of passing. Uh, particularly on vouchers, I you know I think he certainly did not believe that public schools were a were were a good idea. Uh, I don't see how anyone can doubt that. If you look around at the world, yeah. the amount of money we're pouring into the public schools and what we're getting out of them, um, that system has not worked. And I, I think that was very clear to him. I think he also thought that um, it was more realistic uh, to allow, in terms of what you could accomplish, to allow the public school system to survive and to and to offer people alternatives to it via a voucher system that would let people opt out. And I think he he clearly hoped, and I think probably explicitly said that if you had a voucher system, then eventually the public school system would wither away because people would move out of it to other uh, better uh, sources. It was a way of responding to people who said, uh, no, no, uh, you'll never get a, a better alternative to the public schools. It was a way of him saying to them, all right, let's look. Let's give people a choice. Uh, you think public schools are so great? Let's keep the public schools. Let's give people alternatives and let's see what they choose. Um, I, I think it was a reasonable uh, position. That it was probably in the long run, in his view, a good way to eventually supplant the public school system entirely. So maybe here the issue is, do we try to do something really radical that we uh, have 90% of the population opposed to, or do we try to do something slightly right. less radical that will convince people, that will give people evidence that they can see with their own eyes 
that our policies work better than the ones they support. Uh, I, I think that was largely the, uh, and you could argue both ways on this stuff, but I, I don't think, uh, sure. I don't think his position was unreasonable now. And with vouchers, he, he, I think you can argue that he did not have the kind of success he had hoped to have, but we have had a lot of experiments sure. with things along those lines and charter schools and so on. So things have gotten better. And I think they've gotten better because of his proposals had he offered something more radical, would we have something even better or would we have what we had 40 years ago? I, I suspect the latter. So I. Yeah. And while I have you know my own differences with with Milton Friedman, I do think that some of the criticisms are, are unfair because you can only take people as far as they're willing to go. And he, in my view, and I believe he said it, was offering transitions a means to get from A to B where people weren't ready to just go directly to B. So I, I do think that some of the criticisms are unfair. I also don't think that there's ever been a better communicator there of, of, been <laughs> of economic ideas than Milton Friedman. I mean, they're just, they're, they're not there today. And i I've never known of any, at least not speaking. I mean, I, I think Henry Hazlitt was a brilliant writer, but Milton Friedman. You got to mention Bastiat too. Oh yeah, Frederick Bastiat. Yeah, in the in the but, night, yeah. It's funny. But, can I just say that it's interesting that you mentioned Bastiat? The two books that set the foundations for my future thinking were *The Law* by Frederick Bastiat and *Free to Choose* by Milton Friedman. They those two books set me on the trajectory to where I am today. So they're phenomenal, but no, I don't think anybody was better verbally at communicating ideas and in written word too, but just his, his ability to make things simple were phenomenal. He was absolutely phenomenal. And everybody should look at the videos on YouTube, the many, many videos on YouTube of him explaining things and interacting with an audience. And part of what made him such a great communicant, well, part of it was that he was in such command of the subject and so brilliant in his in his arguments and so talented at finding the the succinct way of expressing a difficult idea and 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 saying something in a few sentences that anybody would have thought would take 10 paragraphs uh, and he found the way to say it in a few sentences but beyond that and you'll see it in a lot of these videos the respect with which he treated his adversaries, even when the adversaries had no idea what they were talking about. he You see him in these videos, speaking to an audience, taking questions from the audience, often quite hostile questions. He never lost his cool. He never became angry. He always really listened to what the person was saying, treated the person with respect, whether or not respect was actually due to them, treated everyone with respect, always with a smile and all he was just such a lovable person um and I, I it comes through i think in the videos how lovable he was but not as much as it did in person he was the warmest man i have ever met and he was always warm and kind and gentle with everyone it was it, it you felt the warmth radiating off him he was the uh, i i can't find words for for what it was like to be in his presence. That's awesome. So what do you think, or, or what do you know has been his lasting impact? Not oh, necessarily well, in the economics profession, but I mean, in the broader society, the, you know, our broader political policy. We talked a lot about, I mean, the world has flexible exchange rates now. That's an, uh, a huge change with big uh, implications for the way people live their lives those implications uh, to the to the average person probably it looks like there's a big abstract gap between exchange rates and and what their incomes are but it, it's it's that's vastly improves the lives of billions of people um so there's that uh there is the absolute realization that we cannot think about monetary policy without thinking about his ideas and the exact policy recommendations that he was making in the early 1960s are probably not the right recommendations for today, but his way of figuring out what the right recommendations are is something that we all have um, 
you, you can't think about monetary theory without using those those uh, insights. Uh, you can't think about tax policy without thinking about the consumption function and the permanent income hypothesis. Uh, again, people may not be aware that that's going into the uh, uh, the formulation of tax policy, but it is, and um, uh, so that's with us. The physician's assistants, I think we can trace that directly back to Milton Friedman. Um, and it means, you know, naively you say, well, um, the PA is seeing me. If I weren't seeing the PA, I'd see the doctor. But that's not true because the doctor's got a finite amount of time. If yeah. you weren't seeing the PA, you wouldn't be seeing anybody. Um, and uh, uh, the fact that we get that a lot more medical care because of those PAs and so on, I think we can, I think without Friedman's influence, we wouldn't have that. Um, we've got a lot of people have been able to send their kids to good schools because we have charter schools and we have voucher programs that that stem directly from from Friedman's influence um i think the uh the the differences have been in our daily lives are probably through paths that are invisible to most people but they've been really profound Okay, thank you so much for for taking the time today, Professor Landsberg, to explain to us and talk to us about this wonderful economist. Where can people find you? I know you have your blog. Can you tell us about it? Well, and if you have first a website, of all, I suspect, I'm not sure you needed me for this because it sounds to me like you understand this stuff as well as I do. Uh, you you could have just done a monologue. thank you. That's that's a that's an excellent compliment. I appreciate that. Thank you. But as far as finding me, I have a blog at thebigquestions.com. I used to blog every day. Now I blog like once a month. So there's not a lot of current stuff there, but there's a lot of old posts. Uh, and if you sort through them, you will find some that uh, probably I shouldn't have posted, but a lot that, I, that I'm that i glad are there and that I think you can learn something from. Uh, I, I happen to have on my desk here, so I'll hold it up, a book about Milton Friedman, uh, which uh, uh, you can find on Amazon. And I think you can, I uh, this is published by... Um, the Fraser Institute, and I think they're uh, you can download the PDF for free. I think if you uh, if you Google around for it, and the price on Amazon is incredibly low. Um, uh, my more recent book is called "Can You Outsmart an Economist?" It's a book that tries to teach economics through a series of brain teasers. Um, uh, so there is that. Uh, uh, I have a book called The Armchair Economist. Which, so I'll mention my most recent and my best selling. There are a few okay. other books in between. But the most recent book is Can You Outsmart an Economist? The best selling book is The Armchair Economist. And again, there's my blog. And uh, uh, and don't forget The Essential Freedman. And The and the Essential Freedman, the one I held up. Thank you so much for being here today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being uh you know, a podcast host who actually is fun to talk to. They aren't all. Uh, <laughs> they aren't all. Thanks. For now, this is the Rational Egoist signing out. I'm Michael Leibowitz. Till next time.